Coming up on show 689, how to get $13,000 off a brand new Audi e-tron EV with a new Costco deal. Stick around, I'll give you the details. Plus, we're talking about the Porsche Taycan. Another review seems to cast doubt on that 201-mile EPA range. Porsche invest in a startup software company. Why? I think I might know why. Uh, the Tesla Model 3 has been pitted against the Porsche Taycan for charging speed, and Skoda have their new Octavia plug-in hybrid. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Welcome to EV News Daily for Thursday, 6th of February. Martin Lee here. I go through every EV story, so you don't have to. This weekend is the big meetup on the East Coast in Miami, Base Camp on Saturday. A couple of hours of getting together to enjoy some music, some culture, some EV chat, all organised by My EV with Inside EVs and Evanex and some of the biggest YouTubers and Twitter accounts out there as well. Uh, people going along to do talks. And you can check out EVs and tea. Make sure you RSVP so they know that you're coming. Over 600 people have already said they're going to be bringing their EVs. It's going to be huge on Saturday. Wish I could be there in Miami. If you are going along, let me know and send me some pickies if you do go on Saturday afternoon. Well, I always ask for reviews for this podcast, by the way, and we had a few new reviews come in over the last day. Uh, Shelly Boy says that this podcast keeps you up to date in 15 minutes. It's my podcast for driving to work in a fossil gobbler. Sad face. Uh, Mickey Finn says this podcast is a great way to catch up on the latest EV news. And Marlo says a great podcast. Thank you, Martin, for your efforts. Hey, no worries. I'd be having, I'd be doing this anyway. Uh, well, I, w I was. I was already all, always going through the EV news every day, and I thought, oh, I'll, just, I'll, I'll make a podcast about it because I was just spending all day reading about EV news and, and keeping it to myself. So, look, I love doing this, and there's so much positive news around as well. And normally, there's always a Tesla story or two because there's so much going on with them. But today, it's a triple header. Porsche Taycan story day. Right, first to Porsche, fir first to Porsche, <laughs> the first to Porsche story. Uh, Dan Edmonds at Autoblog says, I'm driving on what he calls his lap of Orange County test loop. It's an EV range test course of Dan's own design, made up of suburban, residential and arterial streets with a stretch of the Pacific Coast Highway as well. Speed limits go from 25 to 60 and much of it in the 35 to 45 mile an hour range. Now, Porsche gave Dan at Autoblog a Taycan to drive and say, go and do a range test and see what you think. Clearly, the team at Porsche still sting over that 201 miles EPA range rating. That is the official rating of that car, 201 miles. And that frankly stinks for a modern EV that costs that much money. Well, Dan at Autoblog continues, I start out in range mode instead of the normal, no default, normal mode because, well, I'm doing a range test, he says. This configures the Taycan to prioritise the front motor and it drops the air suspension to low mode regardless of speed. I begin to get optimistic about the Taycan's chances after two hours. I roll into my driveway with 209.2 miles on the odometer. But bear with me, yes, he's got home after driving 209 miles, but after doing two laps of his test course, he says there were still 78 miles on the gasometer. That, if you add it together, is a projected range of 287 miles on the gum. 43% uh, better than the EPA rating. Uh, Dan says, I've taken numerous trips in many electric cars. I was never concerned about the Taycan, even if the range did really was just 201 miles. But now he says it's abundantly clear the Taycan Turbo's real world range is easily better than the 201 that the EPA gave it. Well, of course, as I was reading this article, one thing that did stick in my mind from the very beginning, he was open and honest and transparent. He did the test in range mode. Now, I don't know how many Porsche Taycan turbo buyers are going to spell, spend 100 grand plus on their car and then drive it around at 35 miles an hour in range mode. I don't also know exactly how the EPA do their tests. I don't know the complete ins and outs of what mode. Maybe they do the default normal mode. Maybe EPA do put it into range mode. They, I doubt they do performance mode. But also, there's too much for the EPA to do 
to test every single new car, so they often get the car makers to do the tests and submit their numbers. It's worth noting that actually with the Porsche Taycan, they did the test. They didn't say to Porsche, give us your numbers and we'll make that. And and they do with others, by the way. So I I don't know what the percentages of cars they do themselves, but... Maybe it was luck of the draw, as it were. But the Taycan was one of the ones that the EPA said, we'll do the range test on that, thank you very much. And it came out with a pretty terrible 201. Now, I've seen... This is the third article I've seen about this. So clearly, Porsche's PR people have been on a schmooze fest with the big auto journalists. I've seen it in Inside EVs, they gave them a car. I've seen it in Electric... Now I'm seeing in Autoblog, I'm sure the others as well, they've been given cars to say, look, it does go further, honest. And all of the journalists, all the articles that I've read about this do say, look, the Taycan does go a lot further than that 201 miles. Although with Dan's test, as we talked about today, I'm not sure driving around slowly in range mode does exactly say what a Porsche Taycan driver owner would do. But good news there, good news that it's a car that will go further than it appeared at first. By the way, Porsche, if you fancy dropping a car off into my driveway for a couple, I'll need it for a couple of months, I reckon. And uh, feel free, I mean, feel free. And I'll give it a really, really, really good range test. You know what, make it three months, better be safe than sorry. Right, second Porsche story. And this is all about investing in software. Now, people often, again, use that software thing as a stick with which to hit the other car makers. They say, well, Tesla's a software company. Tesla's a Silicon Valley company. Tesla's an energy company, anything. But they do say the other car companies lack software now now porsche are investing in a software startup called nitro box a financing round in the single digit million range uh, new capital partners from uh, porsche ventures have invested in a stuttgart based uh, sorry the stuttgart based sports manufacturer porsche have taken a stake in the hamburg based software company well, Nitrobox, who they Porsche have invested in, this is what they do. I had a look at this, and they handle financial processes via a central solution. They handle lots of different financial transactions using a simple central solution that's flexible for consumers. So, from modelling the business model to digital payments, billing, accounts receivable, all those things, they look after it. Why would a company like Porsche want to be doing things in billing? Two things that spring to mind. Firstly, car sharing. Now, I'm not sure too many Taycan owners are going to be putting their car up to do car sharing, but some sort of future where we don't own our cars, but we do need to transact with our cars. Secondly, I'm thinking, you know what? A lot of car manufacturers have got one eye on recurring Revenue, so apps that you can down to download to your phone or upgrades that you can download to your car. So there's an upgrade that you can get that you could pay a certain amount of money for to get new features on your Porsche. That's another option. And the obvious one, yes, the obvious one is charging. The obvious one is needing that uh, uh, ability to be able to go up to any charger anywhere on your route and just plug it in. And then somewhere, somehow, you get billed in a way that is frictionless for you. It appears that's what this software company that Porsche just invested in are all about. And the final Porsche story today, the Taycan is out and inside the, sorry, Electrek declared it the best Porsche ever made. But questions still remain about the Taycan's efficiency and how it affects the charging rate. Well, early owners and reviewers on YouTube have found the Taycan more efficient than the official rating suggests. So how does that affect its actual charging rate, says Electrek? Yeah, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Everyone gets very hung up on range. But what's the point of having a long range if your efficiency sucks? If you can't go very far because the car charges slowly? I mean, ultimately, range is only important if you want to go from A to B to A again and not charge. And so, actually, what can you do en route? And that is the efficiency question. The charging rate question is an interesting one to answer. 
There's a German YouTube channel called Next Move, and they've just put the two cars to the test, the Taycan versus the Model 3. Which one is going to win the charge rate test? Well, Tesla's lower peak kilowatt rate, but with higher efficiency, or the Taycan's really, really fast charging rate, but with lower efficiency. Well, firstly, the first thing they found out was the Taycan doesn't charge at 270 kilowatts, which is the advertised rate, even pulling into the station with 1% battery. They never saw more than 255 kilowatts. But you know what? I can't believe we're arguing about this or even bringing it up as a negative in any possible way. It's an EV that charges at 255 kilowatts. More than 10 times my car. Well, I certainly wouldn't kick that charge speed out of bed for doing you know what. Even if you look at Electrek's own test drive, they peaked at 252 kilowatts. Uh, but what about the charging efficiency? Well, if you charge the Taycan from 0 to 50%, it will charge at a rate of 856 kilometers an hour on one of the fast Ionity chargers. On the Model 3, so we're, we're trying to be 856 here. On the Model 3, if you charge from 0 to 50% on one of their standard chargers, it's a little bit slower than the Taycan, but on a new V3 supercharger, on a V3 you can add 905 kilometers an hour if you go 0 to 50%, which of course is quicker than the Taycan. There are so many variables, so many moving parts to this. And then once you get above 50%, the Model 3's taper in other words, how it starts to slow down the charge rate is a lot more extreme than the Taycan because the Taycan has more battery than they actually give you access to. So it charges quicker for longer. All of these things are kind of moving parts. And again, you know, I know, I know that I can see already my comments on YouTube, my Twitter, people saying they shouldn't be comparing a Model 3, an affordable family sedan with a hundred thousand pound, euro, dollar plus Porsche Taycan but it's an interesting test to do. I agree with you. The, 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 if these were petrol cars, no test in the world would put them in the same test. If these were, you, you know, your regular what car magazines write about, they wouldn't take a 40,000 and a 100,000 car and put them together. But because they're both electric, it still happens in this community. And I kind of understand why. But look, the only thing I take out from this test, they were trying to like prove the winner. Like, who's best? Tesla, slam, dunk, knockdown, Porsche. All I'm seeing here is cars that charge at eight or 900 kilometers an hour. Wow. I mean, the Porsche Taycan going like to 80% of the battery in, what, 20 minutes or something? I mean, I can't get into the, 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 the motorway service station, go to the conveniences, get a coffee, and be back in the car in 20 minutes, and then you're ready to go again. So a lot of this now becomes academic when it's just so quick. Well, moving on, and the lead story today, Audi has a bit of a killer offer on the e-tron SUV if it's delivered to the customers in, cooperate, in cooperation with Costco. An analysis from Cars Direct reveals that you can save as much as $13,000 from the MSRP, says Inside EVs. A dealer incentive bulletin shows that the program began last month it currently involves a $2,000 cash bonus on 2019 e-tron models if you buy or lease them through Costco's auto program. If you do an additional survey, you'll get another $500 Costco cash. You also get your $7,500 federal tax credit in certain states and local areas. More plug incentives are available. There's a $3,000 marketing allowance discount. It's what it's called, a marketing allowance discount uh, by some dealers, but not all, which, according to Cars Direct, can be combined with a financing deal as well. So if you want this deal, if you want an Audi e-tron, you might have to shop around. Might not be your closest dealer is doing all of these discounts, but 13 grand off an Audi e-tron, which can take the price down to $60,000. It's a very very nice car to be inside, by the way. Luxurious place to spend a few hours behind the wheel. That might be for you. And another Audi e-tron story here. Audi's first EV in the US, the e-tron, now comes with access to solar power in a deal 
that's been limited to the first 3,000 customers that go for this deal, but they're not solar panels that go on the roof of your house. It's what's called off-site solar. And this fascinates me, this idea. According to Audi and its partner in the venture, uh, the clean energy supplier Arcadia, what it is is it's a 10-year subscription which includes enough electricity to offset the cost of 2,500 miles a year, or what Audi estimates as one full e-tron charge every month, says car and driver. After signing up to the scheme, the first 3,000 people that sign up to this, customers will pay their utility bill through Arcadia. What they do is then calculate the credits, the savings, that the remote solar panels that I imagine are in a field somewhere nearby you or on the roof of something, um, the savings that that remote solar farm is generating and applying it to your bill. You're getting all the benefits of self-generated solar power without generating it yourself. I think I understand this. I'll put a link to Car and Driver in the show notes if you want to read more. Well, as the first Skoda VRS model to feature a plug-in hybrid powertrain, the Octavia VRS is a family car that has sports car-like performance and pretty good efficiency as well. I've mentioned before, I used to have a Skoda Octavia VRS, the estate one. I'm looking at it now albeit a little toy model that my dad bought me uh, of my Skoda to remind me what a great fun little car that was. Sold it many years ago. Uh, but boy, oh boy, that was a lot of fun. Very, very rapid. Under the bonnet, but this is before my EV days, by the way. I used to lift the bonnet of my Skoda and look at the engine and all of the logos on the engine was the Audi logo. All the parts, all the components had the Audi rings on. So it was basically... It was kind of based like a detuned Audi TT engine. It was 1.8 turbo. It was an estate car as well. I used to get all sorts in the back of that, go camping, put the back seats down. Man, we loved that car so much. I'd have another one if there was a full electric version of a Skoda Octavia. Great family size car, but really, really, really useful. And there's at least a plug-in hybrid version coming this year, and that's going to be unveiled at Geneva. Well, the UK government has announced a grant scheme for local authorities to make Britain's first zero-emissions bus town. Funding's going to be provided for electric buses and infrastructure to the area. Uh, the most convincing plan submitted will win. Says Electrive, the electric bus town scheme is going to have £50 million worth of funding. And the Transport Secretary, Grant Shapps, who I happen to know is a Tesla Model 3 owner and driver, said this, and I quote, Buses carry more people than any other form of public transport, and with 200 electric buses, you can offset 3,700 diesel cars. It's clear they have a crucial role to play, play in bringing down emissions. Uh, good work, Mr. Chaps. And finally, congratulations to the hard-working team at BYD. Yes, they make cars, but BYD also make plenty of other commercial vehicles, and BYD just became the first articulated electric bus to pass a federal test. Uh, the safety test includes brake performance, double lane changing, and stopping distance as well. It's called the Federal Altoona Tests, and their 60-foot articulated electric bus, some people call them the bendy bus, is the first one ever to pass this new federal test in the US. It's uh, used by uh, transit agencies who want to access federal funding to buy buses. And now the BYD K11M is the first one uh, that has passed this test and is going to be available to get this funding from the federal government a rigorous test it has to go through uh, like i say uh, ensuring it doesn't roll down hills with the parking brake that you can swerve lanes it won't fall over and it'll stop nice and quickly as well fantastic news these sort of programs kind of go on in the background that you and i don't realize but i thought i'd report on that today because it's good to know good to know interesting isn't it it's another day of really positive ev news i get a little positivity boost doing this 20 minutes a day it's all it takes and i i kind of come out the end of every podcast going you know what we're going to be okay there is so much going on with electrification in all forms of it you know what we're going to be okay the doubters can doubt the fudsters can do what they do uh, the diesel lovers can hang on to their cars but you know what 
We're going to be okay. There's so much going on. Question of the week this week. On a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is not at all and 10 was completely, um, how much did the environment come into play when you bought your EV and how much will it if you haven't bought yours yet? For me, it wasn't a big deal. For me, I absolutely adore EVs. They're so much fun and performance and they're cheaper to run and convenient every morning. The battery's full and the environment was a part of the decision, but it wasn't the leading factor. So I thought I'd do a bit of an audience survey and ask you, on a scale of 1 to 10, where does it fall? I'm sure there'll be some 1s and 10s and plenty of people in the middle, but I'd like to hear your reasoning. Email me, hello, at evnewsdaily.com. That's my address, hello at evnewsdaily.com. Leave a comment on the YouTube notes. Thank you to 231 patrons of the podcast because you keep me going. I really appreciate everything that you do. My premier partners, uh, Phil Roberts of Electric Future, Brad Crosby and Avid Technology, and every single one of you that supports on Patreon. There are 688 previous episodes in the archive. You can get those for free. That's what the Patreon money goes towards doing. Uh, 688 podcasts have been made and streamed and stored, and that all takes server capacity and things. So thank you very much for uh, for doing what you do on Patreon. Uh, the blog is evnewsdaily.com. It's not special. It's a WordPress blog. I do it myself. Um, but, you know, I'm self-taught, so bear with me. evnewsdaily.com is where you can go to find the old episodes using the little search box if there's a topic that you are interested in. In the meantime, come and say hi on socials by searching EV News Daily. Have a wonderful day. I'll catch you tomorrow. And remember, there's no such thing. It's a self-charging hybrid.